beginning with basic 3D printing class. So what happened this is going to be more advanced and look at random parts and different things. But this is really discovering the basics of 3D printing. Hopefully it's not too basic for people. Um, so I'm Brett Hole. I'm from uh, Shockwave. I'm the heat electrical of Shockwave. And then uh, Sean is on the Cracksburger. Cracksburger. Cracks, cracks from yeah, cracks. Um, it's an FTC team. So I'm mostly doing the first one. I'm going to use slide 200. So there's a, a lot of examples that are FRC from our robots and stuff. But the same thing is going to apply to FTC robots as well. So, uh, so the, uh, I think you see here the printing thing for a robot. You just find a robot and you can print it. Seems like that. <laughs> so the topic, I'm not sure where this can uh, Anyway, so what we're going to cover today for the topics, right, we're going to cover basically what is 3D printed, a little bit about the different kinds of 3D printers and that sort of thing. Then um, some topics about designing for 3D printers, the 3D printing, and different tricks that you can do that you can do different than if you were going to machine it on uh, a regular traditional way for zero dollars. And then it covers some things about the strength, how to add the strength, how to adjust things to get different strength in different areas, and uh, what materials you might want to use. So we got uh, some comparison of a bunch of materials. And then I've got a section on pitfalls, things that, uh, that we've run into on our team with 3D printing that might not have been optimal. And then also places that we found great success using 3D printed parts in uh, robots. So, for some, what is 3D printing? And how can you kind of conceptualize 3D printing? Well, it's not using a mill or blade, which is a more traditional manufacturing style. And that's where you have a big block, like over here, you can see a picture of a mill, right? A big huge block or something, and you have something that shreds chunks off of it, or this here is showing the curl pieces off of the blade, right? Where you're or subtractive manufacturing. 3D printing is really additive manufacturing. It's additive like Lego. If you want to build something out of Lego, you add pieces one at a time in the places you want to, and that's how you get whatever you're creating with Lego. So then, what are the different types of 3D printing? So the, the different types of printers, right, you have SLA, which is kind of a bad name, in my opinion, which is because they just, it's short for stereo photography, which is not really that specific, but in the 3D printing world, what it means is this, uh, this one up here in the top left, and it's this, uh, you have a pocket of resin that's white sensitive, and then you shine a light uh, for every layer that you want to print, and it kind of causes the, the resin to become a, a solid instead of liquid. So it becomes a bit solid, then you do this layer by layer until you get some cool object like the one that is hanging there. So that's your, your SLA. You can get some super good detail out of it, but it's usually not very strong. So it doesn't get used very often in robotics because there's not a lot of strength to the, to the solidified resins. Um, the next one is uh, selective laser sintering, which is uh, really the one that mostly gets used in the industries. Uh, it, where you have a powder, often metal, but not, not always, it can be plastic, so you have some kind of powder, and then they put a little layer of this powder and then hit it with a laser and tell the powder melts together to make a little solid piece of plastic or metal or whatever. Uh, and you can build some amazing things with this. And this actually gets used not just for prototypes, but it's very common for prototypes, but they use it in for like hyper cars where they're only going to make in a 20 of them or whatever. They use it to build the, you know, the turbocharger, the turbocharger blades out of titanium powder and all sorts of weird metal alloys. Uh, Boeing uses this kind of stuff a lot and it's because there's a limited number of planes they build, so they use it for some of their specialty parts. Um, and there's just some things you can do with additive manufacturing that you just can't do with regular milling and machining because of the way it works. Um, now, the other place that you use this kind of stuff for sort of more of an industrial use is for like uh, medical implants or like you're trying to add something to somebody's you know, bone structure or whatever. It's something that needs to be tuned for a particular person because they're an altered order or whatever. And so they'll take a general design of whatever they need, the brackets or whatever they 
they need and then they can modify it and print one out for that person and then you search the page you know, and it gets published as well. Um, and then finally, there's FDIA, which is fused deposition modeling, which is just a fancy term for the, the normal fingerprints that you see all around the room here. So, so this is the one that's mostly used in uh, robotics. Um, we certainly could use the selective laser stitching. I think that would be really epic. If anybody has like $100,000 to give me, and I would buy one of those, that would be cool. But they're a little expensive. So mostly you use the FDM style printers, which are in the hundreds of dollar range. So, FDM. Uh, how FDM works is really, it's, I like to consider it a computer controlled algorithm. So, if you imagine the extruder head on one of these printers, is like just a hot glue gun, and you have a computer that's controlling where the hot glue gun goes. It just squirts out glue until it builds up a thing. And of course, with the internet today, you can find pictures of just about anything. And somebody did exactly that. They took the nozzle out of the hot glue gun and then built a computer controlled setup to extrude hot glue, computer controlled hot glue, and a little cube here with it. It's kind of useless, but it's cool nonetheless. <laughs> So the different types of uh, FDM printers, okay. there's uh, mostly it's differentiated by uh, how you control the positioning. There are, of course, other things that factor in, like kind of categories of FDM printers. Uh, they control mostly by, uh, it's differentiated by how they control the printer. So in this case, right, the, the typical one is Cartesian, which I think all of the printers you see in this room are considered Cartesian. That's the normal one where you just have separate x, y, and z axes, like the Cartesian coordinate system. And, uh, and I can say it's sort of like a, the CNC router, if people are more familiar with that, in screens, and have one of those in the background in here. So I think it's sure. um, The x card is branded this one, but it's basically the same thing. It's very easy to see here the, the x axis right, right here. So I can move the pinch head can move along the x axis right here. The x, Geometry can go the bottom of the y-axis this way, so it can get that dimension. And then there's a little bit of a motor that moves up and down this way, so you can get the z dimension. So it's a whole Cartesian setup. Now there are other kinds, but they're not used as often. Um, there's this one over here that I pictured is a it's called a delta printer, and it's it's a fascinating setup in that you've got um, you only have you have three controls, and they put it in these triangle corners here. And it tends to go up and down, and you have kind of a four bar system from these up and down points to, to control the print head in the middle. So the ones that move all around up and down. Um, it takes more calculations to figure out how to move the print head around to do your printing, but uh, that is that is uh, the built ones. And then the newest one that's kind of uh, up and coming is called Core XY, which I don't know if you can but it's, it's a more complicated setup. Which is very similar to the Cartesian, but it has a, some other properties that people like about it. So the key to, to FDM printing, oh, I forgot to say this at the beginning. If you have questions, just like raise your hand and ask us. I, I know we haven't really hit things with a lot of questions yet, but seriously, if we if you don't ask questions, it would keep us in deep work. Yeah. I didn't have time to put that all in those I can't hear anything over pictures. Can we close the door? Can we get the door shut, guys? So the previous slides? I'm hoping we can publish these, but it really, I just covered basically that the 3D printing is different from the subtractive manufacturing. The only slide I was curious, that one that like said like SLA, selective laser printing, and... That one? Yeah. This one. Okay. Yeah, fused deposition model. Okay. So the key to FDM printing is that everything is about layers, right? Because it does everything one layer at a time, it builds it up from the bottom. And it's, you can think of it like weaving, right? If you have, look at this, you know, you get this um, weaving going on over here, and it's done row by row, 
So it's really all about layers, just like filters. <laughs> so the uh, one of the key pieces in, in 3D printing is called slicing. And so this is the uh, the computer processing that happens before you send it to the printer, or sometimes it'll happen on the printer, but usually it's a separate programming routine where it takes whatever your object is that you CAD and that you download or whatever, whatever your object is, and it slices it into all these layers. <laughs> And the and the, you can control different parameters about it, and that's what all this other gibberish is. Like here is a bunch of different parameters about how the layer thickness and all these other different things, number of walls you can put on there. There's a whole bunch of different objects that you can pick from. Um, but you can see here how it kind of chops things into layers. That's a very key element to understand is that how things work, how 3D printing works, is to be able to understand that it's going to do it all in layers. Because that's the some of the issues that you have to work around when you're trying to figure out how to like design something like can you kind of So some of the key pieces in, in slicing is as I mentioned, you can control the number of walls right here. I'm using two wall pixels to get to the orange and then there's this yellow wall. So there's two lines worth of walls all the way around it. And then one of the other key factors is infill. You don't want to print things solid because it's, it just gets really heavy and wastes a whole bunch of plastic. So if you don't need it to be solid, then you can make it sort of hollow. But you also need some amount of support in the middle. So they put in uh, what's called infill. And you can change the amount of infill, you can change the type of infill. Right? Sometimes you can use different shapes of infill that you, depending on the strength you want or some of the other properties and how much plastic you want to use. But that's what you can see here, just the little boxes is the infill. So there's a whole bunch of different slicers that you can choose to use. There's um, uh, often, especially on the device teams, you end up using whatever it is that came with the brand printer. So um, this one over here is Mark Ford's printer. They have their own software. Kind of need to use depending on. We'll talk more about that later. But if you kind of need to use their software for a lot of the things, um, there's MakerBot has their own. That's what here. So MakerBot has MakerBot prints. I think it used to be MakerWare. I think you changed it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, they keep getting bought, and then they change the names. Um, the one that uh, the, the, my FRC team has is uh, Zortrax. So they have their own little software. It's a soft Z Suite. Um, all has their own thing, right? So there's brand specific ones that come with whatever your brand printer is, but then there's also a lot of printers that uh, just use sort of an open source realm. There's uh, a lot, a, a lot of things on the uh, the output of the slicer is a file called G code, and that's if you're familiar at all with CNC mill or machine or any kind of right, it all operates with G code. But of course, as with any standard, there's a whole bunch of standards within the standard. So, depending on the type of printer, sometimes they'll have special G code commands that you have to use their software to generate the right G code and use on the machine. So, that's kind of related to the like MakerBot and Zortrax. Um, the older MakerBots, uh, they, they started with a firmware called Sailfish, which is but most of the open source ones use Marlin, which is a different branch of what used to be the same source code. But because of that, they have a different set of G codes, so you have to get two different families of, uh, of slicers. So the open source community, I think probably the two biggest ones is Slicer, where you replace the E with a three, because that's cool, I guess. Um, and then Kira, which is uh, mostly done by Ultimaker. Right now, Slicer is a lot of the development Slicer is done by Prusa. And they have their own little flavor, which has a modified logo. But these are kind of your biggest options: is whatever your brand of printer is, or you can look like Slicer or Kira. I know a lot of people use Kira, so it's a good, it's a good Slicer. Uh, with the slicers and these, uh, once you find, I'm going to interrupt you. Sorry. No, no, uh, once you find something that you join, watch out for the updates. Um, take photos, take a, a photo of the, what your settings are, um, because Kira is notorious for doing updates and wiping all your settings up. 
Um, we had that happen in the middle of our build season last year. They wiped all our settings out and they upped us to four point whatever, and we were back to zero. Um, luckily, I took some screenshots of everything, was able to set it back up. But um, when it comes to updates, say no until your <laughs> off season. Yeah. Uh, it's actually really good too. Yeah. Don't, don't don't update during the middle of the season. Yeah, a uh, slicer used to do that too. I think they fixed that in these situations. They don't kill your settings. Oh, yeah, it drives you nuts. Yeah. yeah. All right. So now, um, let's look at the tips for designing for 3D printing. So, the first big points to remember for 3D printing it's not complicated. Gravity works. So, if you design something, and you think about the layers involved, and you think, oh, it's going to print a layer, there's nothing underneath it but air, it's going to look like this. All right? So just always remember, gravity works. Yeah, and you'll come back in, if you don't have supports, you'll come back in, and your whole 3D printer will be this wonderful case of spaghetti, <laughs> and it takes you three hours to clean it out. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, you can have some fun with that. I almost put a whole slide of disasters in here, but um, so now you can do what's called bridging. So where it's printing over nothing. This you can see here from this kind of example, the longer you print. So this is bridging over a fan of air, but it's not very long. And there's just a little bit of a sag, but it's not bad. That's actually pretty reasonable. But you get longer and it's like that's actually pretty substantial sag. You probably have to chop all those hairs out and maybe it's okay, but I don't know. And this one. I mean, that's like, that does not work. So, you can't do bridging, but you, but you just have to be careful. And there's a whole bunch of things that you can tune your printer to bridge better. I've seen printers with bridge better than this. Uh, here on this link, this one is really hard to get it, but you can bridge better than that. If you like, do it really slow, and you have a high cooling fan speed and some things like that, you can maybe get it to bridge a little bit better. It just, you know, in the end, Put it on the space shuttle and then you'll be fine. Um, so sometimes you just need to use support material. Now, this is an example of support material. And this is a, this is the part. The, as you can see this part, there's no like orientation where you wouldn't need support. And so sometimes you just have to pick, okay, we can print it this way and put support in here. That's what all this junk is. And depending on your interior and how it works and other things like that, that support material can be easier or harder to take off. Um, but sometimes you just can't get away without having some support material. But often, having support material can be a disaster. And poor Mario does not want to be here. It's really quite sad. Um, there's, there are times that you just can't separate the support material off, depending on settings and printers and things. It's good settings. But there's, there's one technique that I have never tried myself, but I know some people should have, especially if you have, um, I think some of the printers back then you used a lot have two print heads. But if you have one with two print heads, um, or the ability to do fill the changes, um, you can do this thing, which is a, a soluble support material. So, it's, so this white stuff, I don't know if you can see it very well with that, there's white stuff here supporting this weird, spacey, gravity thing. Um, and you can print it this way where it has this as support material, and then rather than having the disaster of Mario where it's like it just barbed his face up, he said he had bad plastic surgery. Um, you can dump it in some warm water, and then all of this support material washes away, and you end up with that beautiful, spacey, rather thing. Um, it's cool. The hard part with this, though, is that because it is water soluble, it will absorb water from the air. So you have to be like super careful with it. You always keep it in the dry box. It's Maybe have like a film and dryer system that you'd be able to dry it out before you try to use it to print it. And it's a little expensive. Yeah, have you so ever used it? No, I mean, it's it's not cheap to buy. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is more advanced stuff, so you might, yeah. if you're going to experiment it again, definitely find a printer with two heads on it. Yeah, that's probably the way to go with this. I don't know. I've, I've never tried to use it. I, I try to stay away from Just it. try to not use supports if I can. Which is the next topic. Um, so, some of, the, some of the techniques that we found to try to avoid using support, right? So, suppose this bracket is something that you need to print for your robot, which I would actually advise against it because it's not a very good design for being strong. But for the purposes of this demonstration, it was the simple thing that I just threw up. 
So assume this is the thing you want to print. This is the orientation that you pictured it because that's how it's going to be used on the robot. Or maybe it's going to hold the amber white or something. Um, if you throw it in your slicer and slice it and say add support where needed, it's going to come up with this. That is a ton of support. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be hard to remove. And you use a lot of materials. So, anybody have any ideas for what you could do to try to reduce the amount of support? <laughs> Increase the density. Oh, lower the density of support. Uh, that would work. Or you could maybe try to like do it just in the front area here somehow, where maybe it would help. So you it, you it uh, yes, rotate it. So if you change the orientation like that, this is actually I would much prefer this. Anyway. I think it's going to come out stronger in all the weird corner cases where it's, it's going to break here, here. Anyway, but this will be stronger, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you can reduce the amount of support. You still kind of need something to hold up this end, so you need some kind of support here. Um, but but it reduces the amount of support, and probably it would be a lot easier to get the support off uh, in, the, in the part that would work better. So the other thing you can do, which we discovered, is that you can change the actual design itself. Within the parameters of where you're trying to use it, Right, you can change the design. And you can print over hangs like this at, at a 45 degree angle. Virtually any printer can deal with 45 degree overhangs. So if you can add support like this, actually part of the physical design, it looks a little top heavy, so you probably want to do some other modifications to it. But that kind of thing, um, even, even with hardly any uh, infill on it, that would give you uh, the ability to print this without any support. But that's, of course, assuming you can live with this in the design, right? Maybe there's something here and you can't move that. If, if this is all open space and whatever it is that you're mounting here, it doesn't need to stick out of it here. It might work. Yeah. So it's really it's really a try to design the parts to not need support and like everybody just have you. Alright. Um, so where do you get your 3D designs that you want to slice up and then print? Well you usually use a CAD tool. So Virtually any CAD tool, and you know, worth their weight, you can output an STL file, which is what most of the, the, the 3D printer slicer software will use. Uh, and the, this this example here is from Inventor, because that's what our team uses. It's the Autodesk Inventor. So if you have a part and you say export, you pick STL over here in the save as whatever thing, you click on the options. You want to make sure that you Export it in millimeters because everything, every 3D printer that I know about uses millimeters. Most of the US teams for robotics probably use inches, so our CAD, all of our CAD always ends up using inches for their base, you know, for their measurement system. So, but when you want to export it to be put into a slicer, you really want it to be in millimeters. Um, so, note on that, uh, the Ultimaker, the Lewis Bot Mini, um, that one sometimes, but if you don't put them in inches, and you Go from inches to millimeters, uh, and you stick it in inches in the Ultimaker or the Mini, it'll shrink it. Yep. It'll cause it to shrink because these. 25.4x smallest. Yep. So it because it doesn't itself. realize, these don't realize inches. Yep. They're only on millimeters, so you got to make that change. We ran into that a few times. Yes. We have done that several times. And sometimes people accidentally put it in centimeters, and then you end up with something like, wait, this is almost the right time, but it's not quite. It's like off by. 2.5 times. Yeah. Strangely. Anyway, so yeah, so you want to make sure to export it with millimeters and high resolution, otherwise it just won't work right. But when you do that, you export an SDL file, then you can import it into your slicer, everything's happy. Cool. Question. Uh, do you have to set to millimeters? Set to millimeters on the 3D printer? Was the CAD set to 3D printer? <laughs> okay, so another option that uh, we have found very useful is OpenSCAD. Now, a whole lot of people in the robotics world have heard of OpenSCAD, but it's an uh, open source scripting CAD tool, which is kind of weird to think about. But uh, if you're, anybody's in the you know, computer science realm uh, knows about Python and all the rest of the scripting languages, this is just yet another scripting language. But instead of Scripting whatever other runs and operations on the computer. This one describes three dimensional objects. 
So you do things like here, right? This is actually the, the logo, the OpenSCAD logo that I added up here with just this little simple thing, right? I said, give me a sphere, the radius 20, subtract a cylinder out of the middle, right here, subtract a rotated cylinder here, and subtract yet another cylinder this way, except I put it in debug mode, so it pink, and that came up with the logo. So it's like simple to get very simple objects. We do brackets sometimes this way. Do things that are just really simple, like a new block with a thing and two holes. This is like three lines of scripting and you're done. Um, but the real advantage, right? Most of the time we just end up losing a printer. But the real advantage of OSINCHAD is the libraries. So there are some amazing powerful libraries available for OpenScan. People have spent a lot of time describing things in a parameter transition. Uh, so, oh, if you if anybody's familiar with Thingiverse, I know anybody doesn't think of Thingiverse. Yeah. So if you go on Thingiverse and you're like, hey, this is a parameterizable box or whatever, <laughs> somebody designed that in OpenScan. And then you can declare parameters in there, and then you can just tweak the parameters and make it different sizes or whatever. So that's how they get the parameterizable stuff on Thingiverse, just with OpenScan. So the one that we use the most often, and you can see examples here if you want to play with some other effects. Here, I'll pass a couple of the around. Is a uh, uh, this pulley? This one's kind of weird. So this uh, this pulley we designed we designed with OpenSCAD um, by using this this um, open source library, and it has some serious. You won't be able to read it from here, but the, but you can just give it a few parameters like number of teeth. And which belt option you're using? Oh, it's HTV5. No, no, we're using GT2 3 millimeter. Whatever it is, right? It has a whole bunch of different things here that you can select. You can just change one parameter, and boom, it spits out a pulley. And right here, this is one number different. This is an HTV5, and this is like an XL. Maybe I got that. So there's different belt T setups. You can change one parameter, and it'll just cat, it'll just spit out a different object for you. You export the STL, and you print it. Super easy to generate your own pulleys. And they have the same kinds of things for uh, threads. So if you think, oh, I need something which threads on like this, they've got threading libraries, uh, gears, if you want to make gears, all sorts of things. We find the pulleys have to be a nice, a nice setup because it uses so many teeth. Gears, you have a small mesh point, so you get all the stressage of just moving a few teeth, whereas the pulleys allow you to distribute the pressure across multiple teeth. So we end up using pulleys more often than the 3D printing things. So materials, let's move on to the different materials that we use based on the 3D printers. So um, you have a bunch of choices of plastics. The um, the most common ones I've listed here, there's of course like the infinite list because there's just a million kinds of plastics. But um, PLA is probably the most common one. That's polylactic acid, that's just least expensive, simplest to print. It's got a bunch of nice qualities, it's actually very strong too. Um, ABS, that was one that, that, that a lot of printers started with early on in the 3D printing craze. ABS, it's the same thing that the Lego bricks are made of, so it's just a little bit soft, a little bit softer plastic. Um, but it has, it's a little bit more difficult to, uh, to print, but still really good. That's what we use most of the time on our parts. parts. So it's ABS, because that's what those little tracks print as well. Um, PETG is a newer plastic on the market. It's actually got some of the nice qualities of ABS, but it's a little easier to print usually with ABS. TPU, that's the flexible stuff. So like if you have one of those flexible phone cases or whatever. So some printers can do TPU, not all of them. It depends on the way the extruder works. Um, but that can be kind of interesting. It's not quite flexible enough and strong enough to really use for like, oh, I'm going to print my own belt. It's just a, it wouldn't have the longevity, but it can be used for a lot of other things. Um, uh, nylon, that's, uh, this printer prints with their own brand of nylon and stuff, which is really cool, but uh, it's, it has some nice, some nice properties that are interesting to this. And then polycarbonate, um, and that white pulley that I said around, that's uh, a polycarbonate ABS blend. That one is using polycarbonate, which has some, some really nice uh, stretch properties. So, 
a lot of uh, what you'll end up doing is, is choosing the type of plastic. It's so depending on the part and the structural rigidity that it needs versus impact resistance and all these other things. You, you want to pick a different type of plastic. And so um, here's an, an interesting chart with a bunch of different qualities. So it's like, you know, how easy it is to print from a PLA high on that, you know, it's the easiest thing to print. Um, and it gets and it gets pretty good since the dark blue here, right? So it can pretty good layer diffusion, but it has horrible impact resistance. It's uh, it's kind of it's the most brittle of the bunch. It's, it's actually very strong. So on the stress scale, it can handle some of the most stress. So it's really strong, but it doesn't have any give to it, so there's no impact resistance. Um, so it's really on the low side of impact resistance. Whereas if you go into ABS, right? ABS is uh, this foraging mode, right? It's it's uh, much more difficult to print, uh, but but it has uh, it has more impact resistance because it's a little more on the flexible side, and it can have a higher heat resistance. Uh, the other thing I'm PLA. PLA has got a really uh, low grass point, um, so it it, it, can, it melts easier than the other than the other types of plastics. Anyway, so I will go through everything on this chart, but you can see that like the main was PLA. And ABS have very different print of plastic qualities, right? So there are different reasons you want to do the one or the other. And then PDTG is kind of a middle point in some of those things. It's a little bit easier to print than ABS. There's a little bit more temperature dealings than the, the PLA, but it doesn't have that much strength. But it's you know, we've got some options. So there are other fancy things that you could uh, do with plastics and fit. There's a carbon fiber infuse, which adds some strength, and depending on who you talk to, whether it's like better layer adhesion or not, because it's different, you know, there's also different aspects to it. That's one of the things like this printer here, we can talk a little bit more about this particular printer, it's a mark point. But this uh, this thing gets you you should come up and play with it. It's actually really amazing. It's super light 8020 printed on this machine. Two point um uh, two point five around um, two point four point. It's really light. And, and it's very strong, but it has a little bit of flexibility to it, which can be really good in some in some ways because that gives it much more uh, impact resistance, right? If it was aluminum, it got impacted that way, it wouldn't ever flex that. Um, and then if you put it, four of them together, then it becomes a box, then it becomes a Yeah, it's it's got some really interesting aspects to it, and that's carbon fiber too. So it's nylon with carbon fiber granules infused in here, and it's it's a really really nice product. Um, so there's, there's, you can get PLA with carbon fiber, you can get nylon with carbon fiber, PCG with carbon fiber, powder in this, all those things are just sort of powder in this. Some interesting properties. Um, there's wood infused stuff, which I've never used. I don't see any reason for it. I think it's mostly just a visual thing. But, and then um, there, there's a polycarb ABS blend, which is the, this, uh, this pulley over here that I actually, uh, the polycarb gives it a lot more strength, but it's still, Prints fairly reasonably. Uh, otherwise, polycarb, if you just print polycarb all of a sudden, you have to have a really a, a special high end to get hot enough. It's a little hotter than most of the printing will do. Um, and then finally, this is the one that I've never tried this, but I've been super tempted to try it out. I think it's a really cool concept, and that's what's shown here in the picture. Um, there's a company called Proto Pasta, and we've got other companies that do this thing too, but they have, it's a a very waxy PLA like substance that they then infuse a whole bunch of, like, I think this is brass, but they like put a whole bunch of brass powder in it. You can print with that whole thing, and then you fire it in a kiln, it melts off all the waxy substance, and you're just left with the brass, which is an interesting approach to getting metal 3D printing. I don't think it has the strength yet for like what we would want to do with it. It's still kind of on the brittle side because you have all that waxy stuff in there that then it, 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 as it melts off, right, it leaves its kind of porous, so the brass ends up being a little porous side, which gives it more brittle effects. So, and it also changes sizes. And on that, you need to watch too because <laughs> with your uh, print, um, your nozzles, um, if you don't have the right nozzle for this, it will chew your nozzle up. And plot that, uh, so yeah. just be warm. Yeah, because that's you know, all that glass is like it's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, it's an interesting one. Which I'm keeping my eyes on someday. I might try that. So, um, what brands are selling? That's another big question, right? So, you can get brand specific stuff, and in my experience, 
brand specific stuff tends to work better. Right? So even I, our team, we've experimented with these down one that it was so brand specific that they had a little chip in their things and you couldn't use any other roll of film with them there. It was kind of annoying. Um, uh, but with our Zorb tracks, we've actually discovered we've tried some of the generic ABS, which seems to be pretty good ABS, but the ABS that we get from Zorb tracks, while it is more expensive, it just works better. It looks better, the prints come out better, the support material comes off easier, just works better. Um, and, and I've seen the same kind of thing with some of the other printers, where it's like if there's a brand and they sell their own material, you know they've tested and tuned from that material exactly whatever their little tweaks are. To as a plus thing. So, um, well, you can save money with with generics, right? So if you go to your PLA or ABS, right, you can probably find it too. Um, the other thing is that if you get brand specific stuff, then you can get this fancy like the polycarb ABS fuse stuff, and they have a setting for exactly that filament and then it just works. Or like over here, right? This thing, this is their um, Onyx series from Workforce. This is the Onyx filament. Which is very expensive, but super cool, and it prints just perfectly on this machine. Well, all of that is one hundred eighty nine dollars per, per kilogram. Uh, I think it's well, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's expensive. Um, so it's an interesting trade off of what you can do, but uh, <coughs> oftentimes there's that you know the right tool for the job, the least amount of frustration. And if you join like a club, um, you can join three D clubs. And they usually have deals within the club, and they will um, help you figure that out. Um, my robotics club is part of a 3D print club, and they use a different plastic, but they've tested it out, and then you get discounts for being part of their club. So there's another way around, too. All right, so let's move on to strength and temperature aspects and what you can do to change things if you need to. So this is a lot of words on the slide, but so there's one of the things to remember when you're looking at the different plastics properties, which uh, you know, I had on the slide before, is that there's a really big difference between stiffness and stress fracture strength and impact resistance. So PLA is actually one of the more strong materials to print as far as like if you're just trying to bring it, it's going to take a lot more force to print. But the impact resistance, when you hit it in a collision with other PLA is just brittle. So you end up with the brittle versus flexible kind of the scale. And that's where sometimes you just want to change plastics because something is too brittle and you, you know, a few impacts and it breaks. Stress fractures happen. Um, so you can always just change the plastics and you get different properties as we showed on the other slide. Another key factor is the orientation of the part. So just like um, Dealing with wood or plywood, right? The, the layers or the grains of your printed part have a huge impact on the screen. So, if you're just talking about general forces on something, right? the, the forces, anytime you get a shear screen this way across the layers or pulling this way, it's going to have a much higher strength, like 2x higher strength than when you have something that's fighting against the layers because the layers themselves. When it's melting it together, it doesn't fuse perfectly. It's like just, it's a seam. And so things, things will tend to break, especially in PLA, will tend to break across this, this the, the layer fusion, the layer fusion pieces. So like when you were talking about that bracket before, right, one of the best things to do to get strength in the places that you know are going to need strength is to orient the part so that the grain goes the way that you need the strength. Um, other things you can do to try to increase strength or change it in general is number of walls. Right? So the wall thickness on the outside, you know, in draft mode it's like two walls, but if you want it extra strong, you get four walls and you get a lot of strength out of the number of thousands of layers. And then you can change the infill, right? So you get a gyroid infill, which is kind of just something like crazy little spheres shapes or hexagon shapes. Those are actually pretty strong. There. Um, turns out that because those kinds of infills at something like seventy percent is actually stronger than one hundred percent infill just layering it together. You get more strength by adding that internal structure, a dense internal structure, than you do with just like solid plastic. I thought that was interesting. Um, 
And the other thing that's really fascinating is if you really just need more <laughs> layer adhesion, you can tweak things on your printer. You can actually turn off the part to LinkedIn, assuming the part is such that you can still manage it without the part to LinkedIn. But you can turn off the part to LinkedIn, and then the last layer tends to be hotter, and then it'll fuse even more. So you could increase the, the layer adhesion by turning off that part to LinkedIn, assuming the part will print it all. Um, and a bunch of these tips and checks and stuff came from a YouTube guy called CDC Kitchen, which I found to be super educational. There's all sorts of really interesting ideas. He does very scientific studies on the strength of different materials and compares PLA and heat treated PLA and there's all these other techniques that people have thought of to try and think it's stronger or whatever. He does a very scientific study on uh, with a bunch of rigs that he's made for different kind of impact resistance and different pulling strength and things like that. Um, so another technique is what I just labeled as insertion, and that's where this mark for the printer that's the next level up from this one. Um, it has the capability to insert a continuous fiber, so continuous filaments. So rather than this, which has carbon fiber granules ground up into plastic so that it's you know, stiffer, a little stronger, right? This is where it'll print a whole layer and then it'll come back and actually lay down one continuous string of fiberglass or carbon fiber into your part, which adds that much more strength in every layer. Um, and it doubles the print time, or more of the and it is very expensive because if you think this stuff is expensive, it's the next level of other stuff, and the printer is like twice as much. Yeah, but it's really strong. Um, if you, have any experience with the uh, Mii Machine and their 3D printed sorter parts last year? Some of those parts, they printed on the market first with the uh, inserted carbon fiber filament, which is pretty thick. We should check that out. Um, anyway, the, the strength in this chart here, so this is kind of a flex, the strength under flex, and uh, I don't even understand how to exactly, just basically different strength measurements. And you can see here, this is like ABS and nylon are along this line here. This onyx, this plastic right here, is on this chart right here. So this stuff itself, because it's nylon, special blend with infused carbon fiber or whatever, it actually is up here. But then if you insert this continuous fiber piece, this is the onyx line. So this line is going right here. If you insert fiberglass, there's two different kinds of fiberglass. There's a green fiberglass, and then there's HSHT fiberglass, which is this orange line. There's Kevlar you can do, and then you can carbon fiber, which does stuff on this one. So you get different um, strain versus stress under flex capabilities, and you can tune it uh, to get some really nice behaviors by inserting different kinds of fibers, which is really cool. Um, the other trick that we haven't tried but I've considered a few times is this steel reinforced 3D printing idea like this comes up here, where um, this person actually designed the part and then put a put a gap in the middle, a little valley in the middle of it. This stops the print partway through, because you can do that, you can pause prints usually, and then they routed some steel um, cable. So the steel braided cable in there, and routed it all the way through in this little valley that they made for it, and then and then turned the printer back on. So it printed and sealed that steel in there. It was an interesting idea to try to get more strength. Sounds like a pain, but it, it, it's an interesting thing to try. All right, pitfalls of 3D printing. Um, so I talked about temperature. This is an example of somebody who left. Three different types of plastics. They printed the same funny mesh thing in three different types of plastic. This one that's all deformed, PLA, ABS, PETG. Um, the as you can see, the uh, something to keep in mind with plastics is that you'll you'll know when you're printing it's like you know you oh I print this at 200 degrees C. That's really hot. You do print it at 200 degrees C. That's when it's really nice and fluid and molten, but there's another point called the glass point, which is where it just starts to get mushy, but it wouldn't flow well out of a nozzle. And for PLA, that happens a lot, a lot cooler, to the point where if you just leave it in your car in the summer, it'll just melt. It'll just make a mess. And that's what happened to PLA. So the other ones are much better on the temperature scale. PLA 
has some issues. So if you stick it next to motors or any other hot area on your robot, it's a um, The next thing, impact zones. We used this on one of our robots a couple of years ago. It's the in cap or something, but it's in the intake area, and that means it gets smashed all the time. We swap these things out. You can see there's a crack in this one right here that I just took a picture of. Um, we smashed these things like every match in the competition where you would have to replace one on average. Um, this thing is uh, from one of our earlier robots. We had an end cap on here, and it just got beat up. So you know, it was on the intake, a little end cap on this piece of metal, and it just got beat up. Again. And I put this picture in here because it's really fire signature on the robot from 2014. It's like a robot for so we put up a link in some time. Um, something else people don't always consider. <laughs> So this is an example of a case where we designed and printed like six different revisions of uh, a 3D printed part for this Android for the robot safety line. And they kept freaking and then they did the bird ride and it was just a mess. And in the end, somebody looked at it and said, uh, I could do this in like three minutes with a piece of sheet metal. And so they made this. It was much stronger, simpler. We didn't have to wait for the printer for an hour and a half to print something. It's like Sometimes you think 3D printer first, and you make these cool parts, and you print them out, and then you realize, dude, just a piece of sheet metal in a couple of minutes is better off. Question back here. Oh. Uh, um, at what point um, um, would we say that it's an old and used metal for a part? At what point? So typically, I would use metal if. If we have, if we see that it's getting too hot and it melted and it breaks, that kind of thing, um, if we know it's going to be under duress or the impact will make people think it's, um, if it's critical. So, like that motor cap was in the impact zone and the end cap, those are in the impact zone, but if those break, the robot still functions just fine. They were just there to protect things. <coughs> so, those are kind of disposable parts. Uh, but if it's critical for you know, gears or whatever, then you have to go. Um, so, I'm just going to skip back this page a little bit, but this is, we, we only have one printer on our team, and so it gets a little bit confusing sometimes about how to know which thing to print and what order, and you know, it takes a long time. So we've actually come up with this spreadsheet where people order printed parts and then you can prioritize them and you can choose which way to do it and how to print them and what the class of material is and what color they want and all that stuff, and that keeps us a little bit more than just like somebody running randomly with a USB stick. Um, so places we've used 3D printers for robots. I've got a whole bunch of examples here. In fact, a roller like this. One of the coolest tricks that I think we've done is this huge roller here, which was on the intake of one of our robots. Um, we just printed these little discs out of 3D printed material with hardly any infill, and then wrapped the whole thing with one thirty second poly in the tray. And uh, we've discovered that rivets work really well in issue 3D printed material. You just like throw a little hole in it and then you put a rivet in there and it just squishes a bunch of stuff down. But if you have enough um, wall thickness on it, the rivets hold and it's just great. And it makes for a really light and solid roller. Um, there was an example of it. Uh, we use it for all sorts of brackets. There's a couple of different absolute color mounts here. We built these things out of 3D printed parts and just hold the the encoder in the right place so that it can sense things. Um, camera mounts, right? This is the one where there's like a phone camera that the phone isn't in there, but you strap the phone in here to hold it in place. This was from last year's robot with the jump away. Uh, and we added little pieces at the end here uh, because this, this USB connector had always had this problem. It was a little loose and it falls out of the way. So we printed this piece and just cap it off and it sealed it in the perfect place so it never moves again. Um, and then other specialty parts, we use them all over the place for specialty parts. So here um, is one of our robots and we have this, this uh, piece that they hold the, uh, the cable chain in place and we put in these spacer parts for it with like, you know, rounded corners and stuff. This was where it kept the cable chain on the top, printed these pieces that fit over the top to keep it down so it wouldn't fly up. A little bracket here for a solenoid. And then FTC parts, we use battery boxes. Uh, phone holders, things like that over there. Speaking of battery boxes, we have this battery mount piece that's one of our favorite pieces. That, um, I've got an example on the, the Swerve bot back there. Um, 
But it's just this little, little dinky piece that fits in the part of the battery and it fits in this little printed part of the battery. It's a magical strap, I found with these straps, and then the battery is secure. Um, and uh, I'll show you some pulleys. Here's custom pulleys to use the um, last year we used, um, talking about, we wanted to go between metal and plastic. Last year, FTC had to hang robots from the landers. Um, we decided to go, we were going to go metal. We thought we'd try to see how far we could push it. We actually 3D printed one of our hooks in the forge, so. Thanks for this one. Uh, and then probably the thing important is that the this was our summer prototyping project, which is the Ford robot down here. So we printed these Sword modules based on the Jack and the Bot, putting it in its uh, Sword design, at least the cat for it. We printed a bunch of pieces of that and modified a bunch of them for printed things. So you can check that out if you want. And of course, also people print a lot of the awards and the you know, gifts, so you can do that for giveaway things. Um, this is a team you recognize it. We've got a few from other people, so that came from Fred. I think this one was the Eric Simple to reproduce that way. You can pick some colors, you can match the theme of the game that you do, things like that. So, now we're going to the QA. And uh, if you have some examples you want to share of the cool things that you guys have printed, I'll tell you about the picture of the Corona X by the this is the one where um, the extruder head is at an angle and it kind of has like X and Y axis, but it, it, like the whole part that it's printing is on you that like belt. belt. Yeah. It's not that one, um, although that one is cool. I've seen that one too, where it's like it's going to be like 45. Or I have a hard time thinking about how it works, but no, it's actually a, um, it's a different system where the 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 print head moves in X and Y, and then it has two motors that, with a whole big set of belting that wrap around a whole bunch of pulleys and stuff, and the two motors themselves manage to turn in a way that it maps X and Y, which is two motors. Um, and because of the way it works, it's always a nice tension between the two motors, and so it keeps everything really solid. That's about as much as I know, but if you look it up on Wikipedia, you've got a good page on it, and you think, oh, dude, that's like, so many uh, for bookworms, uh, 3D printing handbook, a uh, really good book. This will pretty much, I go to this when I'm having issues. So if you need something, you like books, this is a good book. And I have realized that it is <coughs> four minutes to the next class. So if you need to go to the next class, you might want to take off. <laughs> 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 on the examples and ask questions.